And I want to begin with five points that have not a lot to do with al-Ruqya Shari'ah. They are five points, and I don't say by any means they are the only five. But they are five points which I believe form the basis of getting out of every musibah, every calamity, every problem that befalls anyone. Whether it is a problem in their health or a problem in their wealth or a problem with their family, whether it is arguments between husband and wife or magic or possession of the jinn or psychological problems or whether it's problems in people's work or jobs there are certain maybe five we might get to six key points that must be understood as an introduction and wallahi i genuinely believe that these are some of the most neglected points when it comes to people's problems. People run from you know, one side of the earth to the other to solve their problems. They visit countless number of shuyukh, scholars and tulab al-ilm. They send emails, they, you know, they go for counseling, they do all sorts of things. But so few of them give attention to these specific issues. And they're somewhat unrelated to Ruqya. There's a little overlap, but generally these are absolutely, absolutely fundamental. The first is Al-Aqeedah, a person's belief and their creed. And I believe this is absolutely fundamental in a person getting relief for the problems that befall them and the problems that happen to them how many people come and they don't have proper knowledge of who Allah is they are following practices from other religions which have been falsely attributed to Islam They have beliefs which oppose the belief of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. And so the very first place we must start is where the Prophet ﷺ started with. And that is the correctness of a person's belief. For the better part of 13 years, the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Mecca teaching the people La ilaha illallah. Because if your belief in La ilaha illallah is flawed, then everything you do after that will be flawed. And it doesn't matter if you do the best ruqya and the most effective or that you go to the best counselor or the best raqi. If the soil is full of poison, the seed will never grow. So absolutely the first step, and I'm gonna inshallah ta'ala at this point ask the brothers to link to some lectures. The very, very first step is for a person to correct their aqeedah, their belief, their creed, their iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To correct what they believe in their heart. Giving truth to what Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought. Those fundamental beliefs that define them as a Muslim. If these are not right, ikhwani, then in the vast majority of cases, the ruqya will be ineffective or of limited effect. And yes, we can do ruqya as we will see later on for non-Muslims, 
But the reality is if you want maximum effect in Ruqya or in getting rid of any problem, problems with your kids, problems with your money, problems with your life, then it has to start with your belief. Your belief is what corrects the rest of your actions. Didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, أَلَا إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَى إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ Indeed, in the body there is a piece of flesh. If it is correct, the whole body will be correct. And if it is corrupt, the whole body will be corrupt and it's the heart. So we begin by correcting the heart, by correcting belief. Because wallahi, if you don't have that, then it's not your health that I fear for, but it's your iman that I fear for. And wallahi, I will tell you something. If your belief is correct, then I can't promise you a cure in this dunya. But if your belief is correct, then bi idnillahi ta'ala, if you don't get it in this dunya, then wallahi al-azim, inshaAllah ta'ala, you will get Jannah al-Firdaus in the Akhirah. And if your belief is not correct, you may well get a cure in this dunya. But what will be waiting for you in the Akhirah? Except for loss after loss after loss. So the first thing we do to remove the masaib, the calamities that befall us, is to correct our belief. And if you wish, you can think about the noon, Yunus alayhi salam, the companion of the fish, that when he became in that place in the stomach of the, of the fish, and he thought he would stay there until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. The very first thing that he called out, فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ The first thing that he called out was the statement of Aqeedah, the statement of Tawheed. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ there is no God that deserves worship, worthy of worship, that deserves worship other than you. Exalted are you, free of you from, are you from all imperfections. So he affirmed his tawheed, his belief in Allah before anything and everything else. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَاسْتَجَبَنَا لَهُ We answered him. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ And we saved him from his distress. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And in this way we will save every believer. So this is my first point. My second point from the major issues by which a person can remove themselves from calamities and problems is following the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before that, still on the topic of aqidah, there is an ayah we should also mention. Just to emphasize what I said about belief and iman. That Allah Azza wa Jal said, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمُ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Those who believe and do not mix their belief with polytheism. It is they who will have safety and security, and it is they who will be guided. So Allah Azza wa Jal promised you safety, and promised you security, and promised you guidance when your belief is correct, and your belief is pure. On to our second one, following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ 
let there be a warning for those who go against the command of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they be struck by a calamity or by a painful punishment. This ayah tells us that one of the major reasons that calamities befall people and the greatest calamity is the calamity of making a partner with Allah. But one of the major reasons why calamities befall people is because they oppose the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is one of the major problems we deal with in the appointments when people come with their cases. We ask them, what are you doing? And they're reading this dua a hundred times and this dhikr 21 times and yaseen this number of times and this, this number of times and this ayah and this dua and this narration and so on and so forth. Not a single action or very few of the actions they are doing have any evidence for them in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you are going through a calamity of any kind, look at what you are doing to remedy that calamity. And for every single action you are taking, every dhikr, every dua, every ayah you are reading, ask yourself this. Do I have an evidence for what I am doing from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? If the answer is yes, then continue. But if the answer is no, then stop it immediately. And note that evidence is not my sheikh said or this sheikh said or someone who goes to classes told me that this is the right thing to do. And evidence is, قَالَ Allah, Allah said, i.e. something from the Qur'an. Or قَالَ رَسُولُ Allah, رسول Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, something from the sunnah. With a sahih isnad or a hasan isnad with a chain which is reliable. Or the ijma of the ummah and the guidance of the companions radiallahu anhum, especially those things that they agreed upon unanimously. This is an evidence. Everything else is nothing but an opinion. And I repeat again that so many people, if not the majority of people who come to see me for these cases, the first thing I see them doing is that huge amount of the actions they are taking, the remedies they are taking, the books they are reading, the du'as they are making are weak, fabricated, false, with no evidence. And this includes giving a number to something that Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't give a number to. So if somebody says, I say, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير. It's from the Sunnah. I say it 37 times in the morning and 37 times in the evening. We say stop. Where did you get this number from? See, well, my friend told me it worked for them. That's not an answer. That's not a delil. You bring an evidence for the number from the Sunnah. Otherwise. Change. If it's a general dhikr, keep it general. If the Prophet ﷺ did it without a number, keep it general without a number. If he did it with a number, follow the number that he did it with. So everything you're doing, go back through and start asking yourself, is this in accordance with the sunnah with an evidence or not? The third. At tawbah repentance. It has been famously said, no calamity ever befell a person except because of sin, and it was never raised up except because of a tawbah. Tawbah is the absolute key. 
Absolutely, tawbah is the key when it comes to removing and getting rid of calamities and problems that people suffer from. Really, honestly. And again, what I notice from a lot of people coming for appointments, what I notice mostly from them is I notice people come and they will say things like, Alhamdulillah, I don't do that many sins. Or Alhamdulillah, I'm a good Muslim. The person who says this only proves their own ignorance, nothing more than that. Because every one of us commits sins in the day and the night. And if you don't recognize that, that is your own ignorance. That is not the fact that you are a good Muslim and you don't commit sins. That's the fact that you just don't know the sins that you commit. So start by recognizing that you and I are servants of Allah who sin in the day and the night. And perhaps you'll link to a, you know, some resources to help you with that, to recognize those sins. And then recognize that the reason you are in the problem you are in is because you have not yet made tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. A sincere tawbah. A sincere tawbah is not astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. A sincere tawbah is where you admit the sin that you've done and you stop doing it and you feel regret for having done it and you make an intention never to do it again and if it involved the right of someone you repay that right and you make up for that right that is sincere tawbah along with istighfar saying astaghfirullah with one of the well-known you know, words like saying, Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant. Khalaqtani wa ana abduk. Wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'dika ma istata'at. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'at. Abu'u laka bi ni'matika alay. Wa abu'u bi dhanbi faghfir li fa innahu la yaghfiru al-dhunuba illa ant. Which is known as Sayyidu al-Istighfar. And it's from the, the dhikr that you make in the morning after Fajr and in the evening after Asr. And there are other, many, many others, du'as of istighfar. But istighfar on its own is not enough. It has to come with real tawbah. That means really looking at your life and honestly saying, what sins am I doing that are blocking my cure? And I promise you, if you look hard enough, you will find plenty. You will find a lifetime of sins. All of us, wallahi, a lifetime that you can correct. And again, I see people coming. A sister will come and she's not wearing hijab. She's wearing ordinary clothes, like just loose clothes. And a scarf just, you know, a little bit over her head. And she'll come and say, I don't think I do any sins or many sins. Inshallah, I'm a good Muslim. The brother will come, beard is shaved. The thobe is below the ankles. And these are just the things you see in the first five seconds, let alone what, you, what is in the person's heart and what the person does when... The doors are closed and so on. So don't neglect the excellent means of cure. That is the fastest means of a cure that I have ever seen. In Rukia, I have never seen cases fa cured faster than this. And that is a tawbah. And wallahi, if you only did that, along with correcting your aqidah and following the sunnah, and the only thing you did is just to make tawbah to Allah, inshallah it would be enough for you. To bring about a cure in your life. I can't emphasize enough how important tawbah is in removing the problems that people have. My fourth one. A taqwa. Taqwa is a beautiful word. It means protection. It means to put a protective barrier between what you and something that you are scared of. So to give you an example of taqwa linguistically, if you smash a glass on the floor and you go and you put your shoes on so the glass doesn't go into your feet while you're sweeping the glass up, this is linguistically a taqwa. 
putting a barrier between you and something you're scared of. You're scared the glass will pierce your feet, so you put shoes on. In Islam, taqwa is putting a barrier between you and between the anger of Allah and his punishment and his curse and the hellfire. Subhanallah. How essential is this in removing calamities? How do we make a barrier to protect us from the anger of Allah and his punishment and his curse and the hellfire? What barrier is there that is protective against that? The barrier is to do as much as you can to obey Allah with sincere intention and following the sunnah. And to do as much as you can to avoid disobeying Allah with sincere intention and according to the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a taqwa. This is a taqwa. What did Allah Azza wa Jal say about taqwa? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهُ have taqwa of Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal will teach you. Allah will teach you where your cure is. Allah will teach you how to do your treatment. Allah will teach you how to get out of your problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجَعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will make him a way out. A way out from, the cure, from this problem that you could see no cure for. Allah Azza wa Jal will open a door and make you a way out of that problem. With a taqwa. But taqwa is a process of doing as much as you can to obey Allah. Whether that is first of all the obligatory deeds, then the optional deeds and so on and so on. So for example, just to look at one thing, let's look at the prayer. So the first thing you look at is your fard prayer. And you look at Doing the wajib and avoiding the haram. So you stop delaying your prayer. And you stop being forgetful and negligent in your prayer. And you stop ignoring the time for the prayer. And you stop preferring other things over the prayer. And you do the wajib, you perform your prayer in the right place, in the right way, in the right time. Preferably for the men in the jama'ah, in the masjid. And for the ladies, preferably in a private area of their own room. And there's no harm in them coming to the masjid. If they wish. Then when you've got that obligatory part sorted to a certain extent, you start adding the sunnah into the fard prayer. I.e. for example, the extra du'as you can make in sujood and extra things you can say in ruku' and how to make your prayer even more even better. And then you start adding sunnah prayers and so on and night prayers and duha and you know and duha and so on until you have really you know worked as much as you can on that. And that's just one tiny issue. You work like similarly on other areas. The way you treat your parents, the way that you treat your spouse, the way that you behave towards your children, the way that you raise them, the way you behave at work, your income, your halal income versus haram income and all of these things. Every single aspect of your life, you push it to develop it to the most obedience possible to Allah Azza wa Jal and the least disobedience possible. And again, by doing this, you gain something. When you have the right belief and you have this taqwa, you gain something. You become from the awliya of Allah Azza wa Jal. Those who when they ask Allah for something, He answers their dua. When He asks, when they ask Him, He gives them. And when they make dua to Him, their dua is answered. Who are they? أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ Indeed, the awliya of Allah, those who are near to Allah, no fear is on them, nor will they grieve. They have nothing to fear about the future or the past. Those who have iman, correct aqeedah, 
and they have taqwa. Constant. Kanu yattaqun. Yani they constantly stuck to having a taqwa. So again, how many people are seeking a cure, but they're not willing to change their ways. They're not willing to start praying in the right way in the right time. The sister's not willing to start wearing the hijab properly. The brother's not willing to give up his haram income. And he says, why is Allah not giving me a cure? I'm doing my ruqya, I'm doing my ruqya. But what is missing is a taqwa or a part of a taqwa. And every one of us can improve. The most pious of us in this room. Any one of you sitting here, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows who they are, is the most pious person here. And that person can do so much to improve in taqwa. So this is absolutely essential, ikhwan. That we strive with regard to a taqwa in all of the problems that happen. And finally, in my introduction to getting you know, out of problems, a dua or a dhikr wa dua. Dhikr and dua. How many people go from one side of the world to the other side of the world to get a cure? And wallahi, if they raise their hands in the right way, with sincerity, Allah Azza wa Jal would answer them without them leaving their home. Without them leaving their home. But they have become accustomed to asking people and not asking Allah. And I wrote a little blog post on my, on my website about the issue of someone says, you know, like the rukia, the stuff you've given me is too much. Just give me one thing I can do. One thing you can do, keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Keep on making dua. And there are many, many uh, forms of dua that we can give you, we can recommend. I recommend that you go to a reliable website, for example, duas.com, or you get a copy of Fortress of the Muslim, and you look yourself for duas that are from the sunnah, remember from the sunnah, not ones that got made up by somebody, from the sunnah, that relate to your problem. Anxiety, depression, family troubles, marriage problems, Rukya issues, there are plenty of adhkar and dua that the Prophet ﷺ used to do for every kind of issue and problem. Some are general, like their duas for every problem. Some are specific for particular kinds of problem. Two that I would highly recommend for people who are in extreme anxiety, or three, for people who are in extreme anxiety and distress, Number one, the dua of Yunus alayhi salam. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. There is no God worthy of worship but you. How free you are of all imperfection. How perfect you are. Indeed, I was from the wrongdoers. Tawbah. I was from the wrongdoers. I was committing sins. Accept my repentance. And Allah said, فَاسْتَجَبَنَا لَهْ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِ we answered his dua, we saved him from his distress, and we will save the believers from the same way, the same dua. Secondly, the dua of Ayyub. What happened to Ayyub? Ayyub was rich, Ayyub was happy, Ayyub had many children. He had farms, he had cattle, he had everything that he needed. And Iblis was jealous. And Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to test Ayyub through Iblis. So Allah Azza wa Jal allowed Iblis to affect Ayyub, first of all, in his worship. Like the wiswas and the whispering. And when that didn't work, in his wealth. So all his wealth left him. And when that didn't work in his children, so all of his children died. And when that didn't work in his wife to the point that even his wife went away from him and he was left with absolutely nothing. And he remained praising Allah Azza wa Jal and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he made this dua. فَاسْتَجَبَنَا لَهُ We answered his dua. 
وآتيناه أهله ومثلهم معهم رحمة من عندنا وذكرى للعابدين and we gave him his family back and again يعني even more on top of that as a mercy from us and a reminder to the worshippers of what happens when you are patient and what happens when you when you make this dua and the third dua and by this is not by means the only ones but the third dua that i would highly recommend is the dua allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hamm wal hazan wa a'udhu bika min al-'ajz wal kasal wa a'udhu bika min al-bukhl wal jubr wa a'udhu bika min dala' al-dayn wa ghalabat ar-rijal O Allah, I seek refuge with you from anxiety and depression and sadness. And from inability and laziness. Yani from inability, I'm not able to get a cure for my problem. Or laziness, I could get it, but I'm too lazy to do it. And from stinginess and cowardice, too scared to do it. And from a debt that cannot be repaid and being overpowered by men. Having somebody overpower me and control me. What a beautiful dua. Covers almost every circumstance we're going to talk about tonight. Be idni lai tabarak wa ta'ala. I'll add a sixth uh, point generally, uh, which is another comprehensive way of getting out of problems, and that is as sabr, patience in all of its forms. Patience in all of its forms. That means patience in doing good deeds, patience in doing what you need to do every day, day after day, moment after moment, time after time. You have to do the means to get out of the problem. There's no, po- there's no way a person can say, oh Allah, get me out of the problem, and then he sits on his chair and says, Allah didn't get me out of my problem. Patience in doing good deeds, patience in avoiding sins, and patience with regard to the decree of Allah. Going out there, putting your trust in Allah, a tawakkul, we could add that as a seventh if we wanted to. Putting your trust in Allah by doing what is necessary. Some people say, well, Allah, my business went, I lost my money, I lost my job, I can't get a job, I can't get married. Okay. Go out and do what is necessary. Go out and get training. Go out and learn. Go out and look for opportunities. Go out and look for uh, whatever it is that you need. And on top of that, what should you do? Put your trust in Allah. So go and do what you need to do. And what you can't control, leave it to Allah. What you can't control, leave it to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worry about what you can control. Don't worry about what you can't control. There will be things you can't control. Say, Wallahi, I tried to do X, Y, Z from your treatment, but I couldn't do it because every time I try and do it, I just faint. Okay, you can't control that. But there are still a hundred things you can control. Tawakkul is about doing everything you are able to do and leaving the rest to Allah. So on the sixth and seventh, we can add as sabr or tawakkul. Sabr, patience in doing good deeds. People say, I did your treatment for a week. I'm not better. What shall I do now? Guess what? Do it for another week. Do it for another week and another week and another week. If it takes you 10 years, be patient like Ayyub was patient. And patient in avoiding haram. Wow, you know, I, I got desperate, so I went to a magician. No, patience in avoiding the haram. And patience with what Allah has decreed for you because you don't know perhaps Allah has decreed something for you that is better for you. Remember the story of the woman who was fainting with epilepsy and she was becoming uncovered radiallahu anha. She came to the Prophet ﷺ, she said, make dua for Allah to cure me. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you wish, I'll make dua for Allah to cure you. And if I wish, if you wish, you can have Jannah. So her sickness was a means for her to enter Jannah. She said, I will have Jannah. I, will, I choose Jannah. But make dua that I don't become uncovered. 
So he made dua for her that she did not become uncovered and she remained in that sickness. But because of it, she got jannah. So remain patient with what Allah decrees. Do everything you can. at tawakkul Everything you're able to do. Every means, every road, every avenue, every possible way that is halal for you. And with what you can't control, put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This whole thing, these seven points, require two things. All of them require two things. They require knowledge. And they require acting upon that knowledge. Knowledge and acting upon that knowledge. If you don't have knowledge of what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing, how are you ever going to be able to make a change in your situation? If you don't have knowledge of what's halal and what's haram, how are you even going to know that you're doing a sin? If you don't have knowledge of how to make dua to Allah and when the times are that your dua could be accepted, how are you going to make dua to Allah in the most effective way? Make a serious intention in your life that from this moment on, the way you're going to get out of this musibah is through getting knowledge. But be careful because a group of people get knowledge but don't do anything with it. This is Wallah, I've, I, you know, some of the brothers, they come to me in the appointments, they say, I've listened to all of your Rukia videos, every single one of them. It's okay, Akhi, what Rukia are you doing now? And when he tells me, he's not even doing 5% of what I said in the video. So this is a problem of he has knowledge, but he isn't implementing his knowledge. And then you have the other group of people who come to the appointment and they say, I'm doing this and this and this, and none of it is right. So their problem is that they have action but no knowledge. And read if you wish, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Because this is the key to the matter. Guide us, O Allah, to the straight path. The path of those that you have bestowed your favor upon. Not the path of those who have earned your anger. Why have they earned Allah's anger? Because they do things with, they, they have knowledge but they don't act upon it. They know the right thing to do but they don't do it. والضالين, not those who are astray. Those who are astray are those people who don't even know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. And that summarizes for us our introduction to the way to get out of every musibah. Now we're going to come on to the topic of ruqya because this introduction I'd like to use it for for lots of things. And maybe I will cut it out of the video and use it for marital problems and use it for people who have problems with their kids and people who have problems with their parents and people who have problems looking for a job because inshallah those points are suitable for every single problem that anyone gets themselves into ever correct belief following the sunnah making tawbah having taqwa dua sabr Tawakkul. And they're not the only ones. I mean, those are the ones that I wrote down as being very common in my mind, but Allah, we could sit and think of more, but those are is absolutely essential. And you link them together, you, you carry them together by knowledge and acting upon that knowledge that you have.